Hola guitarristas, tenemos la suerte de estar aquí en Todo Bajos con nada más y nada menos que con Billy Sheehan. Hello. Hello Billy, thanks for being here. My thanks pleasure. for your time. Okay. You just released the Life with the Plov, uh, let me say this right, Plovly Psychotic Symphony yes. album from Sons of Apollo. What are the reactions so far? It's been amazing. We get some incredible reviews. I get uh, emails from people all over the world that have it and they enjoy it very much. And they were particularly uh, happy about the song choices. Oh, okay. And we did some, a couple of extra songs uh, from other artists that uh, were just right for the night. Yeah. And like uh, Pink Floyd cover I saw. Yeah, Pink Floyd, Dio, Led Zeppelin, a couple other things. And it's really cool. Uh, I'm really happy with the way it came out. And uh, it seems everyone else is too. So, <laughs> I've seen a couple of videos and I was super impressed because everything was so incredibly perfect. I guess it was like a lot of hard work there. Yeah, and actually most of that work uh, was, was Mike Portnoy. He did all the... Uh, did all the work on it, all the <laughs> arranging the book and the film editing and all that, so he's quite good at all that, so I had to give him a great uh, thank you for doing such an amazing job. Okay, so uh, what's the biggest challenge of working with an entire symphonic orchestra? Well, most of the challenge was for the uh, actual conductor. He had to get the orchestra together, teach them the parts, rehearse, uh, and it's quite a job for him because there's you know, 30 or 40 people plus a chorus, singing it's a lot to organize so he had all that pretty much done when we got there we changed a few little things but it's hard to change anything now that 30 people already learned it uh, so we did a couple modifications and made it made it uh, a little better but we were very pleased with what he did and uh, it's just a matter you've got to get uh, you're going to do it live so you got to get your parts right you know you got to do it the right way so but we had been on the road already for quite a while so we knew we knew that show really good but the the new songs we didn't play a lot So that was a little bit, um, a little bit of a challenge because normally when I play a song, by the time I record it live, I've played it for 30 or 40 times. Where this is our first time to perform them live, so that was kind of it was cool. It was a good kind of pressure. Uh, do you think that the fact that uh, classical musicians come from a very, I guess, a very different way of learning music because it's classical music and rock styles are are hard to match in a way? Well, it's, uh, it's, I guess, some different to some degree, but uh, we, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of classical music. I listen to a lot, more, more classical than anything, I think. And so I'm used to that uh, mentality. So, but it's wonderful to see them work and be just so precise and very together. In the videos I saw you were using your two-neck bass, and I guess you have explained this thousands of times. 10,000 times. <laughs> 10,000. But I, I'd like you to explain for, for our users and our viewers, uh, what's the difference uh, between the necks? Tuning. <laughs> But tuning. So in what are the tunings you're using in each one? Standard. And the other one is... Okay. The low note, the low B. Okay. So it's like a baritone or like you have B, E... A strings of a, f a five string bass. All right, all right. Or six string bass. It's these four. Okay. And then the other bass is these four. Okay. Very simple. So it's uh, for you it's better than having to change to swap basses because you have just don't, I'm not a five or six string guy. I don't like it. I like four. I like the way the neck feels. Yeah. And I it's just my thing for 50 years. That's what I've done. So Uh, I have a six string at home, a TRB, Yamaha is wonderful. I played uh, the song Just Take My Heart by Mr. Big. It was recorded with that. Uh, so it's a great bass, and it's really cool, but I prefer four string necks. So I just, uh, whenever I need to play that low note, I've got a couple basses tuned low B. Okay. Single, two single necks and that double neck. And for lots of years, you've been using uh, basses with stereo output. You have two outputs yeah. in your basses, and you have two wireless systems. Yeah. And then you go into what? I've seen you with Helix, but I'd like to know if you still have that configuration in your pedal board. Yeah, the Helix is configurable for a double in, double output. Okay. So it works perfectly. Uh, so and it, the double outputs go to two different amps for two different sounds. And those two sounds are mixed together in the air. And it's not so much stereo, because stereo is right and left. It's more high and low. High and low, okay. Yeah, one pickup is bright with the articulation. The other pickup is super deep, woof or low. Okay. And that's this pickup here is a super low one. 
the neck position, and then the high pickup is the P bass. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's worked for me since 1971. And the effect chain inside Helix is different in each path? No, I usually find one good patch and stick with it. Okay. And I don't change a lot. Uh, I have the opportunity to go over and turn uh, all kinds of things on and off, but I'm when I started playing, there weren't any really pedals for bass. You plug right into your amp and you played. So I'm still very much in that state of mind, though my signal chain has gotten more elaborate. I don't do a lot of changes. Once in a while, I'll go back and hit one little special effect or an octave up or an octave down for the end of a song. But I don't do a lot of... Uh, I don't like the... When I'm in the audience, I hate to see a guy looking down at his pedal board and stepping on everything all the time. And notice this, the next time you go to a show, you see a guy up there and he's looking, not looking in the audience, he's looking down, he's stepping, stepping, stepping. I don't hear any difference. I'm in the audience, I don't hear anything changing. You know, to him it's changing, but a little more high end. Here's the chorus, here's the reverb. I, in the audience, I don't hear anything different. So I'm not a big fan of a lot of changes. I like, I like the tonality to come from my hands and the bass. And uh, it worked for me for decades, many, many decades. Uh, just uh, working like that. A lot of things you can do to get sounds out of the bass that are that are a lot of variation. Uh, but if you do happen to do that, that's totally cool. I mean, we're all artists. You, anybody can do whatever they want, and it's totally cool. But just for me, as a as a fan and an audience member, when I'm out there and they're paying more attention to the floor than they are to the audience, I, I don't feel right. And like I said, I don't hear a lot of difference. So I I, I For me, I like to concentrate on performing music and delivering it to the audience. Okay, okay. And when we go to see you live, we can hear how you sound. Yes. But we would, love, we would love to know, what do you hear? So what is your monitor mix usually? Uh, bass and a little vocal. Bass and vocal, that's all. Actually, no, there's no bass in my monitors. Okay. But I hear the bass because I'm standing in front of the amp. <laughs> but just a tiny bit of vocal. In one ear, and the other ear is plugged. Okay. And some people, again, go crazy with monitors. They have to have the hi-hat up a half a dB, and this tom-tom's got to be panned, and this tom-tom's got to be panned there. <laughs> and then we need a, you know, the right side of the chorus and the left side. It's just it's insanity. But we, played, we played for years with no monitors. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we, we, I got tapes of those shows, and it sounds fine. And your setup is very different from one band to another. I mean, Winery Dogs, uh, Sounds of Apollo, Mr. Big. Do you change a lot your setup from one to the other? No, it's pretty. It's the same. It's the same. Yeah, all the time. Even in the studio, it's pretty much the same thing. Because you get used to a thing, you get grooved in on it, and uh, it, that works. So uh, I, I wouldn't be comfortable changing things. Once in a while, it's, it, something has to change. If you're traveling to another country, they don't have all the right gear and stuff like that. And that, that, that that's... Maybe a little bit of a bother, but I'll, I'll, I'll always make do. I always try to uh, handle any problem that comes up and just keep on going and try to just concentrate on the show. So, th so for me, the consistency of the bass, my Yamaha bass, my Rotos on strings, my DiMarzio pickups, my Line 6 wireless, my Helix amps, uh, Hartke amps and cabinets, same, 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 same. So if there's a problem, it's me. It's not the gear. Okay. So I know I have to practice harder or work harder or learn more. <laughs> And what's the oldest bass guitar you still have? I have my original P bass that I got in, I think, 1969 or 70. I still have that bass. That's the bass that was the model for this. It has a 68 Telecaster neck, so this Attitude bass has the same dimension as my And same double output. That's where I first started that. And uh, that's my, that, I think, I, well, actually, I have an older bass. I have an old Hofner. I have an old uh, Epiphone Rivoli. I have a 68 Telecaster uh, Fender. Uh, but the main one is my main bass. I still have that. Do you feel like many other people that uh, vintage instruments or old instruments have a special thing? Jimi Hendrix played brand new strats. <laughs> So I, and so did everybody back in the early in the 60s all those guitars were new yeah, yeah. <laughs> they sounded great <laughs> so I, sometimes uh, wood changes as it ages Yamaha has an artificial aging process mm -hmm. they do on the wood for this body it's quite amazing 
because wood, as it gets older, the sap, the liquid sap in the wood crystallizes. Okay. So they have a process to do that on this wood to make it sound make it sound like a vintage base. So, yeah, there is a, 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 an actual change inside wood. I don't know if I can hear it. Maybe some people can. Uh, but uh, so there, there's probably, mostly I think when you pick up an old bass, it's worn in and the feel yeah. sometimes make you think it sounds sure different, you. you know. But uh, there could very well be a lot of uh, uh, advantages to an older bass, you know. But I, I play these Yamahas, they're brand new, and I wear them in nicely. And after a, a tour, it's everything is all smoothed out. It's gotten beat up and a few nicks and... It's uh, it works really well. So, uh, I think uh, each instrument has its own personality. There's a duplicate of this right here, and this is from the factory. This is in a custom shop, and this is the exact same thing. I'm sure they feel a little bit different, even though Yamaha is famous for their quality control, and and the exactness of every instrument is made. But wood is wood. It's never going to be the same. Okay. So there's always going to be a little bit of different. Not only in the shape, in the content of the wood, it came from a different tree, mm -hmm. in a different place in the forest, forest maybe yeah. a different country. Different and being. Exactly right. So the, uh, so an older instrument has some character to it, of course. But uh, I think a new instrument can have just as much character. Okay. Okay. So um, you do lots of tapping. It's a technique that you do, and it's so impressive, I think, for everyone, the first time you they see you. Um, do you feel the bass needs to be in a certain action or certain frets, or you feel comfortable with any bass when you do tapping? Well, pretty much, but the setup is very important. Every, I think every musician should know how to set up his instrument. Drummers know how to adjust every drum, so when they hit it, it's exactly right, the right spot, cymbals at the right angle. Uh, keyboard players have to have exactly the right height for, for their, what they're used to for playing. Uh, guitar and bass, same thing. Uh, I set up my basses myself. I started long ago, before that you could go to a, a guy to set your bass up, you had to do everything yourself. Change pickups, change strings, do everything. So we learn how to do everything. So I do everything on the bass except for refret. I'll do anything else. I'll do all the pickup adjustments, electronics, solder, rewire, all that. So I set up my bass very carefully so that it plays really well. The, the, the action isn't super low. It's about the middle. As I get on tour, about two or three weeks into a tour, I'll raise the action up a little because my hands become much stronger night after night, two, three hour show every night. And so, uh, but I think uh, uh, setting up the instrument is an art in itself. And you can, I can take even a really bad, cheap bass, adjust the neck. And it improves. Yeah, I can make it play great, you know. And uh, a lot of guys come to me with their basses and, I just don't feel right, and I'll, I'll, I'll take it down, and I'll do a couple things. I'll do a little fret dressing, adjust the pickups, adjust the intonation, the string height, and all those things. It can really make a, a, a really cheap bass play great. So a really great, expensive, high-quality bass, you can make just play fantastic. So all the notes ring, and, and it's, it, it feels right and sounds right. So when it comes to tapping, then... Those notes come out really well. Yeah. I saw you live, I think, like at least four times. Mm -hmm. Every time I went to see you, it was an absolute show. You're a great entertainer. And, and for me, it was like a celebration of bass guitar. <laughs> so I'd like you to give an advice for uh, bass players that might be watching us to not to accept to be like in the back of the stage because sometimes uh, bands made uh, like when kids make bands they are so mean with their bass, pa bass player right. and the singer and the guitar player gets all the attention so how would you encourage them to be more bold well i think you have to be careful about the band you're in because generally the audience watches the lead singer mm -hmm. and the second guy they watch is the guitarist and probably the third guy is the drummer and maybe the last is the bass player so if you start jumping around and getting in everybody's way, it could be a bad thing. So always try to do what's right for the moment and the song and the type of band you're playing. Uh, sometimes you gotta play <laughs> and in the background while the singer sings, you know, that's what that's the job of the bass. Sometimes a drummer, kick, hat, snare, that's all you got. Sometimes a guitar player's gotta play just open G chord, 
You know, there's sometimes when you have to do what's what's necessary for the song. And uh, I've played for over 50 years, and uh, there's times in a band when I I pull back and you know let the let's just, this is the singer's spot or the guitar player's spot. I think it's good when there's a kind of an equality, uh, but everybody is their own personality too. Um, I've heard it really bothers me when people talk about making a face when they play, yeah. because you can't think about making a face. Either a face happens or it doesn't. You can't say, okay, I'm gonna look real angry now. <laughs> now I'll look sad. It's so stupid, I hate that. You, the, the whole f bass face, it drives me crazy. Anytime I've ever made a bass, I've never been thinking about it. It's like thinking about how you laugh. I just heard a funny story. Wait, I'm gonna go he he he. No, I think I'll say I'll, I'll go ha ha ha. Oh ha ha ha. You can't think, and it's a natural thing that happens. You laugh. You see something funny. So for me, if you're if you're doing something that's not in your nature, it's it's fake. It's it's a uh, it's I don't like it to choreograph. To think, okay, I'll run to the front of the stage now, and I'll shake my head. You've lo you're gone. You're lost. You're lost. You do what you do because you feel it, and it's natural and it comes out of you. If your thing is to stand there, rock solid, and play solid bass, then God bless you. It's fantastic. Then you'll probably have more impact standing there, not even moving. John Entwistle used to just stand there and play. Everybody loved him because it was it was the real John Entwistle. He didn't have to run around. He didn't have to do Pete Towns and stuff, <laughs> but he was John. That was, it was amazing. So, but if you're real and honest about what how you move and how you play and how you sing, uh, I think that's that translates better than hmm, I, I got to jump around more. <laughs> I've never said that. If I if I move on stage, it's only because it's 100 percent natural. I never I never think about what kind of face I make or how I move. It's just and sometimes I'm out there and I don't move around. It's not, I'm you know I'm not. I don't feel that way that night. Mm. I want to. I want to. You know, stay in one place and hear my bass at the same spot. You know, so. But uh, honesty okay. with things like that, I think, are very important. You have to be. Uh, I don't believe in creating some kind of a weird character, and yeah. you know, that's a great thing about music. When you see an actor in a movie, somebody dressed him, somebody cut his hair, somebody put his makeup on him, somebody told him where to stand, how to stand, somebody told him how to act, how what emotion. And somebody wrote the words that he's saying. Yeah. Is he even there? No. <laughs> no wonder they're replacing them with the computer generated. It's cheaper. It's cheaper, and they don't need as much. Uh, so I, you know, for, but for musicians, we're real. We're there. It's us on stage, live in front of an audience, and we we sweat, and you know, we feel emotion. And I think that's that's why music for me is, well, it's been characterized by many philosophers as the greatest art form. And they call it the great art. And it is the great art because it's the, I think it's really the most honest art when you see somebody playing and I'm playing and I, I, I feel it and uh, it, you know, it may show on my face, but I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about this and that audience. You know, that's what I'm thinking about. Whatever happens with me, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about being honest. My bandmates are going to watch this and they expect me to do a confession to you. Uh -oh. <laughs> Because we stole a trick from you. Oh, you, you're not the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, I think you were singing uh, Smoke on the Water uh -huh. and you, do, you did something like this. Smoke on the water. Okay, so we started doing this in our shows and we got lots of gigs because of that. So we have to thank you. Well, you'll actually have to thank David Bowie because that's where I stole it from. Ah, sorry, this is David Bowie. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. It comes from somebody. But I can't believe no one else borrowed that to, 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 to sing like that. I thought it was the coolest thing. I saw David Bowie do that back in the 70s and I thought it was great. So enjoy it. Thank you, anyway, Give for, for sharing. Give me half credit. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, a, this is a special question because I was watching a um, video the other day of Billie Eilish, a pop singer, like trap, hip-hop singer. Mm -hmm. And she went alone into the stage just with her brother. It was like an electronical music. Everything was a backing track with the, you push play and that's it. But his bro her brother was playing bass on stage, on electronical music. So my question is, um, 
has bass, uh, bass guitar survived better than guitar? Because they say that the death of electric guitar, blah, 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 in pop music. Um, how do you feel bass guitar is in modern electronic pop music? Well, guitar has a more signature sound and character where bass is kind of universal. And so, therefore, you can, uh, I think, bass uh, will always fit in. But I don't believe that anything about the death of electric guitar. I think guitar is more alive now than it's ever been, and thank thank goodness, I'm glad. Uh, but but it is true. I know some, I, I, you know, I've listened to some electronic music, and I'm a big fan of a lot of uh, uh, synthesizer music from the earliest days of the, when, when synths first became uh, popular and some classical synthesizer stuff and uh, electronic dance music, I, I, uh, I listen to a lot. And it's funny because I try to challenge, when I hear that, and I know the bass is really done on a synthesizer, and then I try to play like that on a real bass. This is kind of cool. I, I'll do things like an octave, like, like a... Into the... And try to play, and play. So it's it's hard to do that. So it's kind of cool. So I try to. I thought it would be a good idea. I haven't seen it. Probably somebody's doing it. But it'd be great to have a real band go out and play that music. Oh yes. But actually play it for real, with real instruments. So you mean you mean the synthesizers might inspire you to come up with ideas sure. that other way will be more difficult. Absolutely. Uh, well, I believe inspiration can come from anything. I listen to piano players, sax players, a lot of classical, as I said, jazz a lot of 60s garage punk rock music, all kinds of stuff, heavy metal stuff. And there's always something in it that you'll find appealing somewhere. Some of it maybe you'll borrow. Maybe you'll get the idea of it, change it, and make it into something new. But uh, why not? Uh, electronic dance music, I think, is um, there are just millions of people that get into a giant room and, <laughs> and, and dance all night long like that. That's cool. Wouldn't it be cool if it was a real band? And there were musicians up there yeah. instead of tracks. So I think it's, you know, if musicians thought it through, so why don't we do a band and play that music? Because you can get super deep, low, you know, that's a B string down there. Why not get a, you know, the low F sharp string and get super deep, ultra, you know, low and get a big subwoofer amps and uh, some of the stuff may be on tracks. But there's a, there's a band called Breaker Box in Nashville now, and it's just a young lady and her husband is a drummer, and they do tracks and they play the electronic. It's, it's great. It's awesome. I want to. I kept every time I see them. I want to. I want to play bass with you guys. <laughs> so maybe the next time they record, I'll do that. But uh, why not? It's cool. Why not take an inspiration from anything? You know, it's important. Harmonica. You know, sax. Anything. For beginners out there, what are the difficulties that they might find to start the band nowadays? And how different are from the difficulties that you found when you were a beginner? Well, when I started, it was an amazing time in music. It was uh, about 67, and uh, there were bands everywhere. Every street, every block, there were band two or three bands on every street. You walk on a summer night, you can hear a band, keep walking, there's another one, there's another one. Drive down the street, you see drum kits set up in people's houses in the window, you can see, amazing. And there were so many places to play. In Buffalo, New York, on a Friday night, there had to be 100 gigs, 100 places to wow. play. Unbelievable. And that's just Buffalo. Then Cleveland, Detroit, Boston. <laughs> Every city in America was like that. And all over the world, too. I have 60s garage rock collections from Spain. Hundreds and hundreds of recordings of all these bands that played in Spain back in those days. There was so much, so much live music going on. So we don't have it as much anymore, but why can't we create it again? Uh, many times in my old band in Buffalo, we would make gigs. We went down to the beach one time, this beautiful spot on the beach across the lake from Buffalo in Canada. We said to the owners of the beach, why, we, we, could you build a stage here and run power out to it and we'll set up and charge people an extra dollar to come down and we'll play. Okay, about 5,000 people showed up. And it turned into a, a, a national venue where, where major acts would come and play. And it was just our, our idea. The Playboy Club in Buffalo, New York, never had a rock band ever. So I said, why don't we do it like a rock night one night? Because there's always lounge bands, yeah. jazz stuff. So they brought us in. There were a thousand people in the Playboy Club. <laughs> it was fantastic. 
Kids get an idea. A little coffee shop. It's got a corner. You know, come with acoustic guitar with your friend and you know, do some and play. Take requests, you know. Or uh, put on the internet, give us the 10 songs you want to hear. Go back and learn them. Go out and play them. Everybody sing along. You can create a gig, too. So it's not only, um, we're not only under the control of the people who own clubs and gigs. We can control that, too. So sometimes you have a rehearsal hall, a rehearsal space. Invite some people in and play for them until and, and make it a party. Van Halen started by playing in people's backyards at their parties. That's not what they did. It became a thing. They'd set up in the backyard. They'd get a, uh, a keg of beer. They're all kids were underage, so it was illegal. So they start playing <laughs> until the police came, and they shut it down. And the next weekend, they do the same thing. And that's how the band started. They played parties all over L.A., and it became a thing. Van Halen was this great band that played parties, and, they, and then the police would show up, the police helicopters, and they'd break, the, you know, and everybody would run. But that's read the story. That's exactly how Van Halen started. They made their own gigs. So the set list was as long as police would take to get there. So until and when they showed up, you had to get rid of it. <laughs> But uh, so it's possible for anybody to start to play more gigs. You know, uh, you can talk to uh, a, a, a restaurant owner, a club owner, a little bar with a little corner with enough room to set up, and a little banquet room set up in there, quiet, not don't blow people out. And uh, so I think it's time for musicians to. Uh, take matters into our own hands mm -hmm. and start playing. But the one important thing you have to have is you've got to be great. If you can go out and do that and you're great, people will see you and go, wow, these guys are pretty good. Let's come back next, uh, next Thursday, every Thursday night. And a lot of clubs in L.A. started doing a thing where every Tuesday night, one band would play there. And back in my early days also, we had a place in Buffalo called The Barrelhead, a little bar. Tuesday night was Talos Tuesdays, my old band Talos. Our first time there, there was two bartenders, three waitresses, and four people at the table. That was it. Next week, it was 10 people. 20, 50, 100. Became the biggest night of the week in the whole city was Talos Tuesday at the Barrel Head, lying around the block to get in. Because we got smart, and there was no uh, dressing room. We'd get done with our set, and we'd step off the front of the stage into the crowd, And they were all our friends. We start talking, having a drink with them. What, uh, how does you like to set? Pretty good, but I've been listening to this new Robin Trower record. I go, oh, so we go home and learn some Robin Trower next week. Oh, he played it. So he brings 10 of his friends the next time. So there's all kinds of ways you can make things happen. So there aren't as many gigs available right now. I think it's time to make some gigs happen. I'd like to see that. I usually finish the interviews with the same question, which is, tell us one short advice for music and a short advice for business? Uh, well, for music, um, learn songs and sing. Learn songs and sing. Uh, who, arguably the richest musician in the world plays songs and he sings. He plays bass with a pick and it's Paul McCartney. Oh, yes. and he's the most successful musician in the world, the richest musician there is. I think it's really important to play songs and learn songs and learn great songs. Uh, the Beatles were a copy band, a cover band. Van Halen was a cover band. Almost every band starts out as a cover band. ACDC did, Dio did, everybody did. Uh, and then when you learn songs and learn how to play with an audience, then a natural progression is you start to write your own songs and then move on from there. But don't skip the learning part. To perform great songs live is a great experience. And every major musician did that. You'd think they just woke up one day and said, I'm going to be Bon Scott and sing this hard rock and roll ACD. No, no, he was playing, he was playing uh, cover songs and love songs before that. You know, eventually nature will take its course. And the advice for a uh, business advice well, what you have when you're uh, in a band or you're a musician is you have a product. If a product, uh, there's a product right here. It's a bass, it's for sale. Very nice one. Yamaha TRB, very nice bass. Uh, so it's for sale. So Yamaha makes that bass. We can't choose who buys it. That's up to the public. So you got a product, you got to make it great. You got to make them want it, make it something they like. Don't complain that no one's coming to see you play. You got to draw them. You got to make a product they want. If you're making hamburgers, that's a product. If you make hamburgers that taste great, there'll be a line 
to buy your hamburgers. If your hamburgers are bad, no one will want them. So I'm not comparing the great art to hamburgers, <laughs> but you see the parallel. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to, to create music, even if it's cover music or copy music initially, but to, to, to do something that's really great that people are going to love. And people are going to want to be around. They want to dance to it. They're going to sing along with the band. They want to come next week with their friends and the next week with their friends. So you got to create a product that works. We see all around us products. That microphone is a product. M many manufacturers of, of microphones. Some are good, some are bad. The one you're holding is probably a Shure microphone. Probably. Is it? Uh, I think so. Is it a Shure mic? Biodynamic, another okay. great company. Yeah. But you see, uh, they make a great product. So people find out about Biodynamic and say, hmm, i, I got to have one of those. They sound pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So when they go see your band, uh, you know, uh, Billy and the Bozos, and you're pretty, pretty, <laughs> and you're playing great songs and they like it, they're going to want to come back. So you really have to create something. And it doesn't mean you have to m make pop or popular music or uh, easy music. You can make the most progressive, heavy mind-blowing psychedelic experience ever witnessed in the history of mankind but it better be good it better be the it better blow your mind you know guar or ramstein or karen carpenter or frank sinatra there's all kinds of ways to to do it but it's got to be good mr sheehan thank you thanks for your time thank you for this interview my pleasure i learned a lot thank you very much that's very good thank you very much Guitarristas, esperamos que os haya gustado mucho esta entrevista, que lo hayáis pasado tan bien como nosotros. Eh, no olvidéis suscribiros a nuestro canal si os ha gustado, darle a la campanita para estar siempre a la última de todas las novedades que vayamos poniendo y dejad vuestros comentarios aquí. Así que nada, os dejamos con un saludo de Billy a todos vosotros. Billy, do you want to say hello to guitarristas? I do. I want to say hello to guitarristas. Hola, amigos at uh, guitarristas. Uh, gracias. <laughs>